Hey there, this is Hello Ego with EDM Prod, and today we're gonna be talking about music theory for producers. This is one of those subjects I hear lots of students say they wish they knew more about, but they're maybe a little bit intimidated by the subject and they don't really know where to start. But the good news is that you don't need to know all of music theory in order to write compelling songs. You really just need to get the basics down. Before we dive in, I wanna tell you real quick about the EDM Prod Mastermind Community. Mastermind Community is a free group that is for anyone who's producing any sort of electronic or dance music. You get access to bi-weekly meetings, free Ableton project files, a free downloads vault with hundreds of samples and synth presets, community feedback from other producers, and lots of other benefits. If you're interested in the EDM Prod Mastermind community, we've got a link in the description below. Go ahead and check it out. We're gonna start by talking about notes and scales. So what is a note? A note is nothing more than a single pitch. You can see on this little virtual piano keyboard I have here that I just played the note C. Each note has a letter associated with it and also a number. I'm gonna start off using just the white keys. So first we have C. Above that is D, E, F, G, A, B, and then back around to the C again. Now each of these notes also has a modifier and we say that would be a sharp or a flat. These are called accidentals. So a sharp means that you raise the pitch and a flat means you lower the pitch and how much you raise it is just a half a step. So a half step up from C lands us on this black note here and that is a C sharp. Half note up from D is a D sharp. However, the D can also go down a half step. And that is a D flat. Notice that C sharp and D flat are the same note. And whether you call it a C sharp or a D flat depends on what key signature, what scale you're working in. We'll cover a little more about that later. So we have C sharp or D flat, D sharp or E flat, F sharp and G flat, G sharp or A flat, A sharp and B flat. I wanna bring your attention to two sets of notes here. First of all, between E and F, you'll notice that there is no black key. What this means is that there's usually not gonna be an E sharp or an F flat because if I go up by one half step with the E, I just land on an F. And if I go down by a half step from the F, I land on the E. Same goes for B and C. There are certain keys in which you'll be using E sharps and B sharps. And we'll go over that when we talk about key signatures. So in Western music theory, which is the most common school of music theory that most pop and EDM is written in, you only really have to worry about these 12 pitches. So now that we know all the notes of the keyboard, we can start arranging them into scales. Now all a scale is, is just a collection of these notes that sound good together. The two most common types of scales would be major and minor. Let's start by talking about major scales. So if I wanna make a C major scale, I would start on the note C. And C major is pretty easy because it uses only the white keys on the keyboard. Major scales tend to have a pretty happy tonality to them. They're a little more bright and uplifting than minor. The note that you start the scale on, in this case C, is called the root of the scale. Now every major scale has the same set of intervals. And by that I mean whole steps and half steps. A half step would be between C and C sharp. That's called a half step or a minor second. And a whole step is when you skip a note and play the next one. That's a major second. Minor second and major second are two names for intervals. More on that later in the video as well. So by doing a particular series of whole steps and half steps, we can create our major scale starting on any key on the keyboard. All we have to do is whole, whole, half, whole, 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 half. So a whole step, a whole step, a half step, 
whole step, whole step, whole step, and one more half step. That same series of whole steps and half steps creates a major scale regardless of what key you're starting on. So starting on a C, we'll go up a whole step. So skip the C sharp, go on to the D. One other whole step, up to the F, another whole step up to the E. Then we have a half step between the E and the F. Another whole step, whole step, whole step, and then one final half step. Let's try and build a major scale using this formula on some other key. Maybe we'll start with a G. So we'll go up a whole step to the A, up another whole step to the B, a half step to the C, a whole step to the D, whole step up to the E, another whole step up to the F sharp, and then finally a half step back around to the G again. Let's try one more and we're gonna find a key that utilizes more of the black notes. Let's go ahead and make an E major scale. E, whole step, up to an F sharp, another whole step to a G sharp, half step to the A, whole step to the B, whole step to the C sharp, whole step up to a D sharp, and then a half step back around to the E again. So you see how organizing this into a whole step, half step formula, we can easily create any scale we want. So now let's move on to minor scales. So in order to transform a scale from major into minor, all you have to do is lower three notes by one half step. Those three notes are the third, the sixth, and the seventh. So just by taking those three notes down by a half step, we've suddenly transformed this into a minor scale. Notice that the minor scale has a little bit more of a somber and sad tonality compared to the major scale. Just like the major scale, the minor scale has a series of half steps and whole steps that we can use to create a scale based on any key. And it's actually a little bit easier to remember than in major keys. The pattern is whole half whole, whole half whole, and then whole again for the octave or the final note. So we're gonna go whole, half, whole, whole, half, whole, and then whole again. Let's go ahead and build a minor scale on F. So we're gonna go whole, half, whole, whole, half, whole, and then whole again for the F, the octave. Each of these notes of a scale also has a number associated with them, and these are usually expressed in Roman numerals. This becomes important for later when we start building chords on the different notes of each scale. So let's move on to intervals. Now, an interval is just the distance between two notes. So we already discussed two intervals, the minor second and the major second. So let's move on to the minor third. And the reason why it's called the minor third is because this is the third note of the scale, but it's lower, it's a half step lower. So therefore it's minor. And then we have the major third. And now we have the fourth. This one gets a little bit weird. This is not a major or minor fourth. This is actually called the perfect fourth. It has a very harmonious sound to it. There's not a lot of crunch in the note like there is in the minor second. Very crunchy because the notes are so close together. But this is called the perfect fourth because if I were to lower it to try and make it a minor fourth, I just wind up back there at the major third again. Up next is another weird one, and this one has a few different names. This is what's known as the tritone or an augmented fourth. An augmented just means we've raised the note by a semitone by one half step. It's got a pretty interesting history, this interval. It was actually outlawed by the church back in the Middle Ages because it's got a very, very crunchy sound to it. 
and therefore it was not allowed to be used in compositions for the church. It's actually also called the devil's tone or the wolf's tone because it's got kind of like a howling to it. Moving on, we have another perfect interval, the perfect fifth. Again, another very harmonious interval, sounds great together. And then for the rest of this, we're back to major and minor. We have your minor six, major six, minor seventh, major seventh, and the octave. Now, when you're listening for these intervals, it's a great idea to try and associate them with some sort of a popular song. For example, the minor second. That's the Jaws theme. The major second is the first two notes to Happy Birthday. A popular song that utilizes the minor third would be Seven Nation Army by the White Stripes. Please forgive my terrible piano playing. I am not a pianist. Also, what child is this? The major third is the first two notes to Kumbaya. Or, oh, when the saints go marching in. It's also the first two notes to Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, but the difference here is that it actually starts on the third interval and moves down to the one. Moving on to the perfect fourth, probably one of the most well-known songs that uses this is Here Comes the Bride. It's also the first couple notes to the Harry Potter theme. Up next, we have the tritone, or the augmented fourth. This is the first two notes to the Simpsons theme, where it goes like, The Simpsons. If you're familiar with the musical West Side Story, this is also used in the song Maria. The perfect fifth, one of the most famous examples of this, is Star Wars. Moving on to the minor six. This is used in We Are Young by the band Fun. If you're familiar with that song, it's the part of the song that goes like, ba da da, ba da 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 da. I don't know, I can't play the rest of that. The major six is popularly used in the NBC chimes. Also, My Bonnie Lies Over the Ocean. and also dashing through the snow. The minor seventh interval is the first and third tones from Pure Imagination. So if you ignore that second pitch and just play the first and the third, then we have Pure Imagination. We have the major seventh. That's used in Take On Me by the band Aha. And then finally, we have the octave, and this is Somewhere Over the Rainbow. And also, Let It Snow, where it says, oh, the weather outside. So by being able to hear these intervals and associate them with popular songs or songs that you yourself know, you're going to be able to really listen for these intervals and be able to transcribe melodies, be able to, you know, figure out what chords are being used by figuring out the different intervals using the chords. Which brings me to my next point. Let's use intervals to start building some chords. So a chord is nothing more than a collection of notes that are played simultaneously. The most simplistic chord is the triad, which is made up of three notes. When you're building a triad, you start on a note. Let's just stay in C major to make it easy. This is referred to as your root note of the chord. And then all you have to do is skip the next note in the scale. So we're gonna skip the D, move on to the E. And then we're gonna skip the F and move on to the G. And what we've just played right there is a C major triad. Notice how it has a bit of a triumphant and happy sound to it. 
The same way we used interval sets to figure out scales, we can also do the exact same thing with chords here. So the major triad is made up of a four, three interval set. So we start on the root, count up by four, and then count up by three again. And we get our major triad. Now we also have minor chords as well. That right there was a C minor triad. And you notice the only difference between C major and C minor triads is this one note in the middle. All you have to do is lower the third by a half step and you get your C minor triad. The minor triad has a bit more of a somber tonality, just like the minor scale. And in order to figure out the interval set for a minor triad, all you have to do is flip those two numbers. So instead of four, three, we have three and four. Start on the root, count up by three, then count up by four. You can build a triad on any note of the scale, but in most cases, you're gonna to wanna to stick to only the notes that are included in that scale. This means you're creating diatonic chords, and diatonic just means in the key, right? You're not using any notes that are outside of that particular scale. So let's go ahead and build triads on all of the notes of the C major scale. Well, we already started off with our C triad. Next we have D, E, F, G, A, B, and back around to the C again. Just because all of these chords are in the C major scale does not mean that every single one of them is a major chord. In fact, the major and minor scales both have a very particular set of major and minor chords within them that's gonna be the same for every scale. Let's take a look at these. We already know the C, E, G is a major triad because we have four and three. But if I were to play a D chord and we count up from D, we have three and four. That means this is a minor chord. So, a chord built on the one of any major scale is gonna be major. A chord built on the two of any major scale will be minor. A chord built on the three, also minor, because we have three and four. A chord built on the four will be major, and the five will be major as well. Six, we're back to minor, and now we come to the seven. This is a bit of a weird one. Let's count the steps. We have a three and another three. This is what's called a diminished chord. And a chord built on the seven in any major scale will always be a diminished chord. We can't make it a major or a minor because that would utilize notes that are outside the scale. For example, if I tried to turn this into a minor chord by counting up three and then four, I would land on this F sharp here. There is no F sharp in the key of C major. So therefore, we have to play this F right here. Because remember, the way you build a chord is to play the root, skip a note, play the next one, skip a note, and play the next one. Inherently, this is a diminished chord. And what that means is we play a minor third with another minor third interval on top of it. If this is minor, then by lowering the fifth, we get diminished. So that different set of majors and minor chords and the little diminished extra thing on top there, that's gonna be the same, like I said, for every major scale. But what about for minor scales? So we're gonna do a C minor. And remember the C minor utilizes E flat, A flat, and B flat. Those three notes right there. So let's start off by playing the one chord. We can already hear this is a bit of a sad, more somber tonality. Uh, if you're familiar with how the major and minor chords sound, you instantly know that this is a minor triad. We can confirm that by counting. We have a three, four interval set. Therefore, it must be minor. So any chord built on the one of a minor scale will be minor. Up next, we have the D chord. Mm, bit of a crunchier one right there. Let's count. Look at that. That's our diminished chord like we talked about before. So any chord built on the two in a minor scale will be a diminished chord. And now the three. 
that's going to be a major chord. Let's go ahead and build a chord on the four. We have our minor chord right there, so the four is minor. The five will also be minor. The six will be major. And the seven will also be major. And then we go back around to the one minor. So chords built on minor scales will always be the one is minor, two diminished, three major, four minor, five minor, six major, seven major. All right, so triads are all well and good, but what if we wanna spice these chords up a little bit? Well, we can actually add a note to these chords to create seventh chords. The reason why they're called sevenths is because we will add the seventh note above the root note of the chord. Working in C major, I start with my triad, and then just like before, we skip the next note and we add the B. And what I've made right there is the C major seven chord. If I wanna make a C minor seven chord, I start with a minor triad, and then I add a B flat. And we have our minor seventh. Just like the triad, there's an interval set we can use for this. The major seventh uses a four, three, four interval set. So starting on the C, we count up four, then up three, then up four again. And the minor has a three, four, three interval set. So let's go ahead and build some seventh chords on the C major scale. We already know the first one is a C major seven. The second one is going to be a C minor seven. Third one's an E minor seven. The fourth one is an F major seven. And now we get to the fifth. The fifth one's a little bit different. Let's count the intervals here. We have four, three, three. So this is a major triad with a minor seventh added on top. This is what's known as a dominant chord. So any seventh chord that's built on the fifth scale degree is going to be a dominant. Usually musicians won't refer to this as a G dominant seven. They're just gonna refer to it as a G seven chord. So for major sevenths and minor sevenths, you will say G major seven or G minor seven, but for a G dominant, you can just say G seven. Dominant chords have a very strong pull back to the one. And therefore they're really often used when building chord progressions to lead back to the one chord. Moving right along, we have a A minor seven chord. So now we get to the seventh. Now remember, we have a diminished triad on the seventh. So when we add the seventh to it, we get what's called a half diminished seventh chord. If we want a fully diminished seventh chord, we have to lower the seventh by a half step. So a half diminished seventh chord has a three, three, four interval set and a fully diminished has a three, three, three interval set. You won't get a fully diminished chord if you're working diatonically, because remember, we only can use the white keys if we're in the key of C major. Therefore, this A flat is not in the key. That fully diminished chord is very crunchy because all the intervals are kind of close together. You might've heard that in old movies, like, you know, someone's tied up on the tracks and uh-oh, train's coming. To wrap up chords, I wanna talk about the Roman numerals. You may have noticed that I've been using uppercase or lowercase Roman numerals here. That's because we use an uppercase Roman numeral to specify a major chord, and we use a lowercase Roman numeral to specify the minor chord. Also, any seventh chord is gonna have a little seven attached to it as well. All right, so now that we discussed chords, let's talk about chord progressions, which is just a series of chords that are played sequentially. One of the most common chord progressions is gonna be one, four, five, one. I've got a few other common chord progressions here. We have the one, five, six, four. I'm sure we've heard that harmony in tons of music. Next, we have the two, 
five, one. This is pretty commonly used in jazz. And here we have a very famous chord progression. This is the one from Pocky Bell's Canon, and it's used in all sorts of pop and EDM music. You've really heard this everywhere. This is the four, six, three, four, one, two, five. Let's take a look at a chord progression used in a popular song, Hey Jude, by the Beatles. So how do we figure out what each of these chords are? First of all, I'm gonna get rid of the melody just so we can focus on the chords. So this song is in the key of F major, which means it uses the F major scale. The F major scale only has one flat in it. We can figure that out for sure just by playing the F major scale based on the whole, whole, half, whole, 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 half set that we had earlier. It uses all white keys, except for this note right here, which is the B flat. The reason why I wouldn't call this an A sharp is because we have an F, a G, an A. So the A has already been used. When you are dealing with major and minor scales, you're gonna use every letter one time and one time only. This is very important. So we're not gonna have two A's, an A and an A sharp. Instead, we're gonna have an A and then a B flat. So knowing that we're in the key of F major here, we can take a look and see that what we've got is a chord built on the F. That's the one. So this is a one, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. A one major or an F major chord right here. Up next, we have another major chord built on the fifth. So that's a five chord. Then we have the same chord, but we got the seventh on top. So this right here is a five dominant seven chord because we have that four, three, three, interval relationship. Also, we know that any chord built on the fifth scale degree is going to be dominant. We go from the five, seven back to the one. Like I mentioned earlier, five, seven to one is very strong harmonic motion and it's often used in this way. Next, we have the four chord. So if we count up here, we have the one, two, three, and four. The B flat is the fourth scale degree. We've built a major chord on top of it. So it must be a four major triad. Then we go back to the one, back to the five, and back to the one once again. Now, if you notice, these chords jump all over the place. There's some really big leaps between some of these, and it kind of makes the whole flow of the progression sound a little bit choppy. This brings us to the subject of inversions. So you don't always have to have a chord stacked from the root up. This is a C major triad and it's in what's called root position, meaning that the lowest note of the chord or the bass note of the chord is the root of the chord. But if I want, I can take the C and jump it up an octave. And now we're in what's called first inversion. In first inversion, the third of the chord is in the bass position. But if I wanna jump the third up an octave as well, I'm gonna switch an octave here because I have a tiny keyboard. Now we have what's called second inversion. And second inversion is when the fifth of the chord is in the bass or lowest position. So root position, first inversion, second inversion. And when you're dealing with seventh chords, you also have a third inversion as well. That's when the seventh is in the bass position. Now, in addition to inversions giving chords a little bit of a different flavor and color, it also serves a pretty practical purpose when we're putting together chord progressions. It's gonna help us avoid all of these jumps that we're seeing here, and it's gonna make for a smoother progression. So this kind of goes back into the way that choral music is written. If you're a vocalist, then you know that making large jumps is often pretty difficult. It's really hard to kind of nail a pitch when you're making huge jumps. Let's take a look at this and pretend we're a choir singing this. The top note is the soprano, middle is the alto, and the low is the bass. So if the soprano has to sing the highest note of each chord every time, then we got some huge jumps going on here. We have to jump from a C to a G, 
the middle alto voice has to go from an A to an E, and the bass has to jump all the way up to a C. But we can actually invert these chords to avoid those huge jumps. So I'm gonna take both of these notes and jump them down an octave. And now we have a new relationship between the notes. The soprano voice stays C to C, the middle voice only has to go down a major second to the G, and the bass voice only has to go from F down to E. These two chords function the exact same way harmonically, but now it's going to be a much smoother progression. So this is what's called voice leading. Let's go through here and try and get some smoother voice leading for the rest of this progression. I really don't want this huge jump here, so I'll take all of this, move it down an octave as well. That fixes the relationship between this chord and this one as well. I'll take the F down an octave, and I'll take these two down an octave as well. There we go. Now our chord progression is properly voice led. It sounds a little smoother and it has a much nicer flow to it. Now you don't always have to do this. There are plenty of examples where chords jump all over either for you know musical or artistic effect. But if you're finding chord progressions that you're writing feel a little bit amateur or a little jumpy or just like they don't flow, this is a great thing to do to try and get them so they work a little better. We can also use inversions to create more contour to our chord progression. For example, if I want this progression to have kind of an upward flow and then back down again, I can move some of these notes around so we can get that shape going in the progression. I'm gonna take the E back up here. I'll take these two notes up as well. And I'll take the F and the A back up. So now we have an upward motion for the first half of the progression. I'm gonna take the B flat up as well. Let's move these two up. And then maybe just the F. So now we have an upwards for the first half and a bit of a downward motion for the second half. Let's speed this up so we're not sitting here forever. Now our chord progression is telling more of a story. You can really use your chord progression to convey energy and emotion by kind of setting it up so that it either goes upward, down, up and down, really so it's moving whatever direction you want it to move throughout the chord progression. So let's go ahead and reanalyze these now that we've made some inversions. This is still gonna be an F major triad. Up next, we have the five chord, but the five is in second inversion because the fifth of the chord is in the bass position. Here we have our 5-7 chord in third inversion because the seventh is in bass position. And we have the F major chord in second inversion because the fifth is in bass position. Now I wanna talk about writing a bass line. So when adding bass lines to a chord progression, oftentimes you're gonna be mostly using the notes that are in the chord, but you don't always have to. I wanna start off by creating a bass line using just the roots of each of these chords. So we'll start with our F, then a C, then another C, then back down to an F. Next we have a B flat, and then an F, C, F again. There's something very important I wanna bring up here now. Because we've added the root note of each chord to the bass line, which is now the bass position of each chord, none of these chords are inverted anymore. It doesn't matter what we're doing up here because the lowest note in this chord is still the root. Therefore, we've just turned all of these chords back into root position chords again. 
building the bass line on the one of each chord is definitely going to be one of the stronger bass lines that you can make, but it does cause a lot of jumps and it maybe isn't exactly what you want out of your bass line. So what I'm gonna do is adjust a few of these notes to get a little bit of a better contour to these basses. Maybe we're gonna follow the contour of what's going on upwards, or maybe we're gonna make some inverse motion, have the bass line go down first, then back up again. So the top chords go up and down, the bass line is gonna go down and up. So I'm gonna adjust these to other notes in each of these chords. We'll make the second chord go to an E. Here we'll jump down to a C. Let's go to an A for the fourth chord. For the fifth chord, I want this B flat still, but I'll take it down an octave. I want a C for this chord. And then we'll make this one an E. So now my bass line goes down and up while the upper chords go up and down. This is what's called contrary motion. I'm gonna take this whole thing up an octave because it's getting a little bit low. Now we have adjusted the bass notes of the chord, so therefore we will have to call some of these different inversions, right? This is gonna be still root position because F is in the bass, but now we have a C, E, G. So this is gonna be in first inversion. This is a root position, because the C is down here. This is first inversion, again, because we have a one chord, F, A, C, and the A is in the bass, and so on. Now, when you're writing a bass line, you do not have to stick just to the notes that are in the chord. You can add some other notes in, and it will help make your bass line more effective and a little more interesting. However, you typically don't want to sit too long on non-chord tones, or it could cause the chord to feel like it clashes with the bass. I've added a few notes in this bass line here, some non-chord tones, but they're a little quick, so they're really just passing through those notes. This is what's known as passing tones. With one exception, this C is not in this chord. I decided to make this a longer note just to kind of show you what type of conflict you might hear if you're using non-chord tones and sitting on them for a long time when rating a bass line. So this feels a little bit awkward to me. I might adjust that just simply by extending the B flat and shortening the C. And I will say a lot of the rules about creating bass lines also applies to writing melodies. Let's move on to talking about keys and key signatures. So I've mentioned it a few times, but let's just talk about keys. The key of a track is basically what scale that track is using. So if a track is in A minor, then we use all the notes in the A minor scale. Doesn't mean you can't use some other notes outside the scale, but as I mentioned earlier, you might wanna treat those as passing tones and not sit too long on them. Otherwise, it might sound kind of clashy with the rest of the song. So when we use our scale interval sets to build a scale, we will inevitably end up with a series of sharps or flats. So for example, I'm gonna go ahead and build a major scale on D. So we have a D, E, then we have a G flat and a G. Now remember what I said earlier, two of the same named notes cannot exist in any scale. So this G flat has to be an F sharp. We can right click over here and set this to sharps instead. And now we've fixed that. So we have a D, E, F sharp, G, A, B, C sharp, and D. So in the key of D, that means you're gonna have two sharps. That's called the key signature. Let's go ahead and build a minor scale on A flat. Why not G sharp? Well, I will show you. Ableton's actually doing something that's kind of weird here, where they're mixing sharps and flats in with each other. You really don't see this in key signatures. Usually it's going to be all sharps or all flats. If we switch this to flats, we now see everything in here is flat. So we have an A flat, a B flat, and a B. 
Now, let's use our newfound music theory knowledge to think about this for a second. We cannot have a B flat and a B existing in one key. So technically, what this is, is a C flat. Because if you notice here, the C is skipped in this scale. We know that if we lower a C by one half step, we get a B. Ableton's not really detecting this as a C flat because it's right on the note B. But as a music theorist, now you know this is actually C flat. Then we have a D flat, E flat. Once again, is this an E or is it an F flat? It's an F flat. G flat and A flat, crazy. So the A flat minor scale has a flat on every single note of the scale, seven flats. It's a really good idea for you to try to memorize the sharps and flats for any scale, because then if you're trying to figure out the key of a sample or the key of a MIDI clip or just what key your own track is in, you can look and see, first of all, which chord feels like home base? Which one feels the most resolved? That's gonna be the one chord. If you have a chord progression that does something like this, one feels like home base. It feels like the most settled part of the chord progression. So I would first assume, okay, perhaps this is one. And then I would take a look and see if there's any sharps or flats in any of their notes. And it seems like almost every note of the scale is used. Yeah, looks like every single note is used here and none of them have a sharp or a flat. So therefore we know if C feels like home base and there are no sharps or flats, that brings us to our C major scale. And we know that we are in the key of C. The last thing I wanna talk about here are relative major and minor keys. So if I were to play the C major scale, We know now the C major scale uses only white keys, but check out what happens when I play the A minor scale. It also uses only the white keys of the keyboard, but it just starts on a different note. A relative minor of a major key is a minor scale that uses all the same notes found in the major scale, but it just starts on a different note of the scale. And that different note is now perceived as the root of that scale. The way we find a relative minor from a major key is just count down by a minor third or three steps. The note that you land on is the starting note for your minor scale. Let's take the F major scale. We have one flat in the F major scale, a B flat. And if I were to count down by three steps, I'm gonna go ahead and make a scale starting on D that uses the same notes as F. and we get our D minor scale. If you wanna find the relative major from a minor key, all you have to do is just take three steps back up from the root key of the minor scale. If you're a DJ, you might notice sometimes that Rekordbox or you know whatever analysis software that you use sometimes gets this mixed up. You might know the song is in A minor, but it's analyzed it as C major, and you're wondering why would it do that? Well, it's just because that those two keys use all the same notes, and therefore the analysis software is getting a little mixed up. But as long as you can hear the tonality of the song, right? Does it sound happy or sad? Or if you can tell that the root or the one chord is an A or a C, then you'll be able to figure out exactly what key that's actually in and properly mix that song. There we have it. You now know everything you need to go forth and write compelling songs that take your listener on a journey.